Hi chickadees, so today we're going to take another look at a different constitutional issue. On Monday, Tuesday, you took a look at constitutional issues surrounding freedom of speech um, and um, some of the most relaxed laws in the world that the United States has around um, the ability to petition and say what you want. Um, and all of those things. So today we're going to take a deeper dive into um, the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 8th Amendment rights. And um, over the next few days, we're going to be taking a look at stop and frisk, which we'll do today, and the death penalty, which will go into the 8th Amendment. So for uh, today, we're going to be looking at the 4th Amendment which, if you recall, is no unreasonable search and seizures, that you have to get a warrant in order to um, have things gone through that are on your person. Although you're going to see a stop and frisk that there's a little hitch there. Um, and we're also, you noticed with uh, electronics, that could be a hitch. Um, the Fifth Amendment, which is that you cannot self-incriminate. So, um, you can plead the fifth when you um, are your only answer that is honest and true would incriminate you. Um, and the Sixth Amendment, that right to a fair trial, but very specifically your right to a lawyer. Um, so stop and frisk came about in 1968 um, in the Supreme Court ruling Terry versus Ohio. Um, the Supreme Court said that it was okay for... Um, police officers to stop suspicious looking persons um, for their own protection and search them. So the officers have a right to search down somebody before they talk to them um, as long as it is documented. Um, so in today's world, 24 states actively use stop and frisk practices. Stop and frisk practices um, might be seen in, in traffic stops. Perhaps you've seen one, perhaps you haven't, but sometimes there will just be traffic stops where police, uh, you know, every other car or randomly pull over a car and take a look inside and ask where you're going. Um, New York City is most famous or infamous for their practice of stop and frisk. So um, before we jump into what exactly stop and frisk is, I want to talk about what your rights are when it comes to being stopped by the police. Vanessa Redman, I work with First Defense Legal Aid, and right now we are in Chicago, Illinois. So when you are stopped by the police, you have some basic rights. Some of them they read to you with the Miranda rights. Sometimes they don't read the Miranda rights. Now these rights you have whether you're stopped for a reason or whether you're stopped for no reason. You do not have to consent to a search. You tell the police if they ask to search you, I do not consent to a search. Sometimes they won't ask. They will just start searching you. That's when you say, I do not consent to a search. If you don't say anything, then you're legally, you're giving them your consent. So you have to verbally say those words. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say will be used against you, and that's why you should not talk to a police about anything without a lawyer present. So when the police ask you questions, you say, I will not talk, I want my lawyer. And you wait for your lawyer to get there. You want to know if you're being arrested? You will ask, am I free to go? Because the police can lie to you and say, no, I'm not detaining you. No, you're not being arrested. But yet they're not letting you go. So the straightforward way to find out if you're being detained or arrested is ask, am I free to go? If they say yes, then you calmly walk away. If they say no, then understand that you are being detained and you remain calm and continue to invoke your rights. Um, so hopefully that little bit of editing worked. If not, I'll have you take a uh, watch of that video at another point in time. But. What is stop and frisk? Stop and frisk, frisk is an excellent policing tool when it is used correctly, and that is the hitch. Um, it allows police officers to stop and question a person when the officer has reasonable suspicion that someone committed, is committing, or is about to commit a crime, felony, or misdemeanor. So, the stop. Police officer can stop a person when they become suspicious of the person's actions and believe that they're committing or about to commit a crime. They then question that person. A police officer can ask suspicious persons elementary questions. So that means I can't go into detail. Um, you can see actual image of a stop and frisk that has happened before. Name, address, um, where they are going, what they are doing. 
to determine if the individual is in fact participating in an illegal action. And the frisk part of it, um, during the stop, the police officer believes a person is carrying a weapon. The officer can frisk only the area where he or she observed a uh, bulge of possible weapon. The frisk consists of the officer running his or hands over the shoulder outside garment of the person um, where they believe the weapon is located. Um, they cannot reach under the clothing. So, when can a police officer carry out a stop and frisk, uh, stop question and frisk? So there's four scenarios that a police officer might enact these things. The first is if a citizen approaches as an officer um, that has fit a description of somebody who has committed a crime. Um, so a robbery happens, they sketch out the dis what the person might look like, um, perhaps you've seen that in cop shows before, and then um, that person is spotted by an officer at another point in time or someone who resembles that person. Again, you might see some holes in this process. I'm going to talk about that. Um, when can a police officer, uh, or if an officer observes someone fitting the description, they can stop that person. So we talked about that. Now, um, a lot of people will say that stop and frisk made racial profiling a lot worse. And we're going to look at those numbers in just a second. Um, so another option uh, for when people can be stopped, questioned, frisked um, is when a particular crime pattern has been occurring. So the police have a description of the person or method um, that uh, the crime is happening. So, you know, people breaking into cars, um, seeing something like a tool that somebody would use breaking into a cars into a neighborhood at a certain time of day when that pattern has existed. Um, so fitting the description or under unusual circumstances, it's 3 a.m., um, you know, everyone's gone home, and you're around a neighborhood that doesn't have any businesses where people would be out at 3. Um, those would be those types of things. Another circumstance would be when a police op officer observes a person acting suspicious. So, uh, this can be a little hazy um, in an alleyway late at night. Um, it doesn't need a complaint from anybody, so just this acting suspicious, um, which most police departments have a lot of guidelines around. New York um, police officers got a lot of backlash because they didn't have as many guidelines um, until they started getting complaints um, about their practice. Um, and the fourth scenario, when police officers are instructed to perform a predetermined stop, question, frisk. Um, so up at UMaine Orno, um, they used to have traffic stops on Friday nights where there was a bunch of underage kids who might go do things and they might drive after doing those things they had those traffic stops like it's it's a fairly common practice um, outside of just New York City um, so hopefully I can edit in again you watching this video um, where the people in Brownsville talk about how stop and frisk has affected their community my opinion in one sentence that is totally unfair bias and everything else. And I'm glad someone took a look at it and made a difference. Stop and frisk has caused frustration on the streets of Brownsville, Brooklyn, where Monday's court ruling was well received. The area saw 3,020 police stops in the first quarter of this year, the most in the city. A federal judge in Manhattan found that the tactic violated the constitutional rights of minorities she declared that the police department had adopted a policy of indirect racial profiling. Going forward, an outside lawyer will monitor police compliance with the Constitution. The, the decision that was made today, I feel it's, it's okay. It's a, a good way, a good start to move forward. For them to be monitored is like, yeah, it, it makes people feel much more safer, especially young guys my age. Yeah, I think it's definitely a good thing, definitely. Because I don't have to walk and look over my shoulder and worrying about, you know, the undercovers running up on me, jacking me up, harassing me. You know, I could be coming from the store, minding my own business or getting off of work. And they just look at me, feel like, oh, yeah, let's get this guy right here. Like, hey, buddy, like, you know, like, what's the problem? You know, it's uncalled for. But even some people who say they've been innocent targets of stop and frisk see a need for a strong police presence in this particular part of Brooklyn. You know, there are times, like 25, 35 percent of the time that when the cops stop people, they do have things on them, like guns, weed, or marijuana, or whatever. And, and that stuff is what brings the neighborhood down a lot of times, you know, and it only gets worse if the cops don't do their job. If you stop me and frisk me, please explain to me why. 
Bishop Willie Billups believes that Stop and Frisk has helped make his community safer. He works with gang members in housing projects, as well as the police, to lessen tensions. Police work is very, very important in the neighborhood. If we didn't have that in the neighborhood, every drug dealer would be sh set up shop everywhere. We need it, but we need it done correctly. And we need people being treated with respect. That's, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. After stop and frisk has happened, what needs to occur is each police officer needs to make an individual report. Now, these reports were uh, vastly underreported. A lot of people did not fill out um, the stop, question, frisk reports that need to happen every single time somebody was stopped, question, frisked. Um, over 90% of the people over the years were found to have doing nothing wrong at all with the stop, question, frisk. Um, in um, the, oh no, this is all jumbled up. But um, in 2009 alone, what was found was that um, the total stops were 576,394. Um, and out of those total stops, 7,000 weapons were recovered. So that's a 1.25%. Um, of each stop was actually um, found weapons. Um, of the total guns recovered, only 762 were recovered, which is 0.13%. Um, using the NYPD's sources here, a lot of people felt like that is not keeping guns off the street. It's a big waste of time for the people, particularly 90% of them that have done nothing wrong, um, and for the police officers. So how many people were stopped? Um, here are, again, your numbers. Um, 13% increase um, over just from 2010 to 2011. 2011 and to 2013 was when the most stops were happening. Um, each time people were asked to fill out a report, um, and only one of the four times that people actually partook in stop, question, frisks, did the officers fill out a report. So how many people were stopped for contraband yielded from the NYPD stops for the first half of 2010 and 2009? Um, you see that 53% um, of people were black, 9% were white, 31% were Latino. Um, and when you look at the actual population of New York City um, in 2009, you would notice that only 26 of the population was black. 47% is white and 27% is Latino. So you'll notice that it's very disproportionately the people being stopped are of certain racial and ethnic groups. Um, it also showed that when people were stopped, more often than not, it was white folks that had um, actual contraband on them um, and uh, not black and Latinos. Um, whereas more black and Latino people are being stopped um, by the stop and frisks. So one of the issues with this that occurs is, um, I don't know why it's not changing. There we go. One of the issues that occurs with this. So one of the issues that occurs with this, sorry, costume change because, um, my computer started to lag a lot is we have this issue, um, with people growing up under systems of belief that are racist and people's own implicit bias coming through. Um, so if you haven't taken time to explore your own implicit bias, so you know what you've been taught is good and what you've been taught is bad, um, people will act on that implicit bias. And we've seen that in the news like a fair amount lately, more than we ever have because of technology being able to record it. Um, and, and some of it is very deep down and unexplored and other parts of it are actually explored. Um, so this particular commissioner said we stop African American and Hispanic youths because we want to instill fear in them that every time they leave their home, they can be stopped and searched by the police. So some of stop and frisks practices have actually been connected to things that were legitimately prejudiced or discriminatory. Um, and then once you have policing that is foundationally being presented to officers in this manner, you start to have issues um, with the, the 
the discrimination, the racism of it, um, and the constitutional issue that is the larger piece of this whole practice, which is, is it constitutional to just stop people and, and, and pat them down? Um, particularly when you run the risk of these practices being filtered through people's own implicit bias um, lenses. So a lot of this information, you might be like, Miss Bright, where are you getting this? Well, this comes from Senator Eric Adams, um, who is a senator for New York City. Um, he, like a, 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 a regional senator, um, he was a chief of police for 22 years, um, and he lobbied for the refinement of stop and frisk, stop question and frisk. Um, so that's where a lot of this information came from, but I want you to kind of think about it on two separate levels. You have one level where you're thinking about, is this practice without the human error element, is this practice constitutional? And then this other element of it with, if it is constitutional, is it okay then to move forward with something that's like on in this gray area, um, particularly when it could have uh, impact on only certain groups of the community, um, more so than other. Um, so I hope you are doing well and I look forward to hearing your responses to Stop and Frisk.